I'm kind of notorious in our household that whenever I supply fruit, something happens or I get sick beforehand. Um, almost always, I can probably mark on the calendar, sick. I, I can probably count on one hand the number of times I've been able to go to supply fridge without being sick. Um, and fortunately, this is one of them. And I'm so thankful for that. I actually went into labor before I was supposed to supply preach on one of them. Two months early, I, did, I thought I was hedging my bet spine, but still managed to. Last night, Nathaniel realized he could take the baby lock off the door to his room. <laughs> so I didn't get much sleep. Oh, great, I don't have to go to bed. I can sit and watch TV with you, Mom. He says to me, like, this is a new idea. I, at one point, I threatened to turn the light out if he didn't stay in bed. He goes, but then I'll be dead. And I thought, no, honey, you'll be in the dark. You won't be dead. So where they get these ideas, I don't know, but then I'll be dead. Um, have you ever noticed how people seem to have a different understanding of God? I went to a Nazarene college. I went to a Baptist church for a while. I was raised, baptized in the Catholic church, raised Lutheran, went to Catholic high school, Nazarene college. I've got a fairly broad view of the various denominations that are out there. Galen, we, one thing we have in common is that broad view. He went to a Baptist college. It's funny, uh, the MOPS group I go to is at a Baptist church. And it really helps to have that perspective when we come into conversation. It's funny how we all kind of have different understandings of God. And it helps to understand how someone else is seeing God to be able to bridge that conversation. Whether they're a big gaping valleys between our understandings or slight differences, we do seem to see God differently. I, I, my background is as youth director. Galen's is music, so he sings beautifully. Mine is youth director, so I can stay up at junior higher as well. Um, actually, I don't think I could anymore, but I used to be very good at it. Um, one of the assignments I always gave them whenever I taught confirmation was to draw a picture of God. Gave them crayons because it seems to bring out our creativity rather than a pencil or a pen. And asked them to draw God. What would you draw? For some kids, it was an umbrella. Something that keeps the rain off of us, keeps us protected. For some kids, it was an old man with a gray beard. For some kids, it was a cloud in the sky. It was funny that they all drew different pictures. What do you think of when I say that? What picture, if I gave you all a bunch of crayons, would you draw? For most of us, an image of a gray-haired man surrounded by clouds looking down but what kind of expression do you see on that man's face? Is it filled with love? Is it filled with sadness? Or is it filled with tears? Or is he laughing, joyful? When given the assignment, the kids came up with the crown of thorns, a cross. Some even drew little kids because they thought of God looking into little kids' faces. The difference in our understanding of God comes often through denominations. Some focus on grace, while others focus on the spirit. Some on living holy, others on baptism. How can we worship the same God and have such different understandings of God? The truth is that above all images of God, the above, the above all images of God are right. God is a God of full of love and grace, yet a God who disciplines and who asks us to live holy, a God who died on the cross and yet has the power of all knowledge. He both laughs and cries. He is both hopeful and saddened. God is so much greater than we could ever comprehend. 
In the Bible text today, he's going up the mountain with friends, people who have been with him for a long time, people he has both come to rely on and is trying to continually teach. They know something strange is happening when Jesus' clothes become white. What is the transfiguration? Is it something we can understand, even imagine? Is it something the disciples understood? Yet, there Jesus is, casually hanging out with friends, Moses and Elijah, while the disciples looked on. What did they think? The Bible says they were afraid and didn't know what to say. Oddly enough, that doesn't stop Peter. I can imagine him awkwardly trying to look good. Rabbi, it's good for us to be here. Let's put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. It's good for us to be here, the understatement of the year. Peter wants whatever is happening to keep happening. Though he doesn't understand, though he is almost speechless, even though he stands in fear, he knows this is something he doesn't want to walk away from. Let's build homes for these prophets, one for Jesus, one for Moses, one for Elijah. It's human nature to want to control it and make what is good last or at least put it under our control. For generations before Peter and even generations after him, they have tried to put God in a box. We try to contain him, to box him in, give him names. We try to define God's characteristics. During the Israelites' journey, they had the Ark of the Covenant. It was where God lived. As I told the confirmations, it was his address, his zip code. They carried this God around with them. How did they know where to go? The cloud would lead them every day. Somehow God was directing them. But the cloud they didn't understand. The God in the box they did. When that wasn't enough, they built a home for the box. They built it larger than God's last home. It contained more room. But it still had walls. It still had curtains. And it kept some people in and others out. They built the temple. And the temple was an amazing place. Into the Holy of Holies, that place where they believed God lived, his zip code, his address, his bedroom. In that room, one priest, once a year, would go in, and they'd tie a rope to his leg. You know why? If he died, they wouldn't have a body rotting in there. They could pull him out. One, once a year. And they had to be right with God to be able to go in. And if they weren't right, they were afraid that they would die. And then what would we do? Someone else couldn't go in and get them because that was against the rules. So they had this temple where some were allowed and some weren't. And certain curtains, thick curtains, that kept some out. So for the next 2,000 years or so, we try and recreate that box. We have learned a little more. The box is a little bigger. At least we have created more of these little boxes. And we go there every Sunday morning to see God. I will borrow a saying from Buddhism. If you think you understand the Buddha, kill the Buddha. For it is not the Buddha. Christian follower of Jesus, if you think you know God, if you think you've figured God out, then you do not know God. God is more. The abilities of God are limitless. The characteristics of God are limitless. Even the love of God is limitless. Yet we place limits of God all the time. We think we know what God can do and what God can't do. We think we know what we should or shouldn't be praying for. We think some things are too insignificant for God. Sometimes we even think we know how he answers or will answer. We spend our lives trying to get a fix on this God. We only have our human limitations, our own categories, our own understanding to use. So we manage to put God within our understanding, within our own human boundaries. God can't be sad and happy at the same time. We can't. So God can't. God is infinite. 
only in our understanding of what infinity is. God is fast or slow. God is neither. God does not work in our time. God works outside of time. God is. The same words he used in the Old Testament when Moses asked, Who should I say that you are? I am. I am has sent you. I am loves you. I am. We often understand God in the context of who we are. If you feel strongly about love, then you read the Bible and you focus on the, how Jesus shows love. If you believe strongly about justice and discipline, then you focus on the times God disciplines his people, when God makes right injustices. Sit for that, with that for a minute. How do you see God? How do you see God? Are all these different understandings okay? Is it okay that we see God from different perspectives? Yes and no. Imagine for a moment the elephant in the room. The people are blindfolded and aware of what they are seeing or what is in front of them. One sees something smooth and almost flat. He's feeling the side of the elephant. Another says it's long and snake-like. He's feeling the trunk. Another might say it's thin and flexible. He's feeling the ear. Are they right? Yes and no. The elephant is not what each of them feels. The elephant is a combination of what they feel, but even more. The danger in seeing God one way is that you begin to believe that God is just that. You don't see all of scripture. You don't understand all of what Jesus is saying. And we need to be pushed outside of our comfort zones. Now, it is possible that someone not realizing realize what he's touching, the wall and not the elephant. This is the other danger of seeing God one-sided. Sometimes what you're seeing is not God. Our relationship with God is not strictly personal. It's also corporate. It's a community, because God wants us to be in community. And in order to know God, we also need to know each other. You hear about Christians who don't go to church. And it's not just, as Galen said last Sunday, because God says go to church. It's because we need each other in order to see God. Wanting to pick and choose your beliefs from a smorgasbord of faiths and religions has been a common temptation. I've heard people who say they don't want to raise their kids to just believe one way. We want to see God in our own context alone, our own experiences. Let them find who God is. But that's not the way God always works. God, if you think that God is only what I've experienced, it's also called caring for your spirit. It's a selfish and often self-centered view of God. This is not what God wants for us. So we ask the question, how do we know God, the true God? How do we not fall into those traps? The answer is surprisingly simple. God has given us three things to know if what we are experiencing is of God or something else. First, the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit helps us discern, it leads, and it guides. Second is the people around us. God has given us a community from which to understand God. And last, but certainly not least, God has given us his word. God speaks to us through the Bible. These are the guides that keep us focused in our search for God. Each one of us has a theology, a big word. You may not know you have a theology, but you do. A theology is your understanding of God. So we all have one. We all have our own way of understanding God. It's how you speak about God. A lot of what we experience, we cannot put a name to. The disciples probably came down the mountain more confused than they went up. Sometimes that's how it is with God. Have you ever known God was real but couldn't understand it? Have you ever felt his love so completely you couldn't put it to words? Have you ever seen the hand of God guide you places, things you never thought you could make it through? I go back to the statement of Buddha. If you think you know the Buddha, 
kill the Buddha because it is not the Buddha. If you think you've got God all figured out, kill your understanding of God because God is more than that. So I leave you with this question to think and ponder. And if you get a chance today or this week, draw a picture of God. The question that I leave you with is, who is God? Amen.